so, so. Father, you love us immeasurably in ways that just can't be fathomed in a persistence and in a commitment that is unspeakable. Thank you, God, for being so good, so benevolent, and so committed to a people as broken as us. Thank you, God, for the power and the passion that we experience through your word. And God, as we sit in your presence one more time, it is our plea, mighty God, that you would please speak to us, that you would brighten the dark corners of our life, that you would destroy away the darkness and allow Jesus, the light of the universe, to brighten our lives for all of time to come. Father, thank you for taking time to teach us your precious and powerful word. And we pray, God, that you would continue to teach and inspire and lead us in a path that takes us to eternal life. Thank you, Father, for what you are about to teach us. May your name eternally and continually be praised. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome again, friends. And God is so good. God is so good and faithful. And we thank him for all the hard work that God is bringing to pass in, in all our lives and the wonderful truths that he is teaching you and I. Um, we've been studying some very, very important truths. We've been able to appreciate uh, the old and the new covenant. Uh, we looked at the, the, the moral law and the ceremonial law. We took a look at and studied the difference between the two, found out how the moral law is still in effect and powerful. We then have spent past couple of weeks trying to appreciate the old and the new covenant. We've taken time to unpack how the new covenant is built on better promises because God is making those promises as compared to the old covenant, which was based on the people's promise saying, whatever God says, we will do. We have the capacity. But we find that in the new covenant, Jesus says, it will be I who will write the law upon your heart. I will take away the heart of stone, give you heart of flesh. These are God's promises. God is doing that faithful work in us if we give him the privilege to do so. Last week, we also noticed how Ishmael and Isaac, they represent the two covenants. Ishmael was Abraham's fleshly effort to fulfill the word of God, the promise of God. And Isaac represented the child of the promise. He was born by the miracle intervention of God. It was God doing the work, not Abraham. And so it's powerful how Ishmael and Isaac represent the two covenants. One, a child of the flesh. Other, the Bible says, a child of the spirit. Born by the direct intervention of God. It was the promise of God. It wasn't the doing of man. It was the fulfilling and it was the promise of our faithful Savior. So it's powerful how the Bible keeps teaching us these beautiful things and keeps unpacking these truths for us. Now, before we go deeper into the word for today, we're going to look at another such experience uh, that has, has, has lessons to teach us. If you remember, God gave circumcision. He gave this to Abraham as a sign of the old covenant. Now, some would say, but wait, that's a, that's a pretty rough way to, to represent such an important agreement. Why circumcision? And we think about it and... and you know, it, it begins to get and settle into place. You see, God had given Abraham the sign of circumcision to remind him of how he failed by trusting the flesh. Let's go to Genesis 17 and verse 11 and listen to what the Bible says. So Genesis chapter 17, if you have your Bibles, and we're going to take a look at verse 11. So Genesis 17, verse 11, the Bible says... And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant be betwixt me and you. Now, it was a token. It was a sign. It was a reminder of how when Abraham trusted in his flesh, what a terrible, miserable failure he had to face. Now, all through scripture, we recognize that the physical act of circumcision is related, is explained as dependence on the flesh and doing away of the flesh. For instance, in Philippians 3 
and verse 3. Notice what the Bible says, Philippians 3 and verse 3. Very crystal words, friends, helping us appreciate this. Philippians 3, 3, the Bible says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoiced in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. There it is. Clear words. Philippians 3, 3. We are the circumcision. We worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and we have no confidence in the flesh. We don't lean on the flesh. We don't rely on the flesh. Here we find Paul was comparing and, and, and relating how circumcision is a, is a revelation, is a sign of how Abraham had leaned upon the flesh, trusted in his flesh. Now, we also find Paul comparing true circumcision with, with, with that which is called, you know, sort of known as circumcision. Look at Romans 2 and verse 28 and 29. Romans 2, 28 and 29. And notice what it says. Romans 2, 28 and verse 29. The Bible says the cutting off of the flesh was not true circumcision at all. This is powerful. Romans 2, 28 and 29. Paul says the cutting off of the flesh was not true circumcision at all. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. There it is. Paul is saying here that you're not Jew because there was an outward cutting away of the flesh. That is not true circumcision. Let's keep reading. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. Circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. Listen to those words. The word true circumcision is indeed of the heart. Notice in, in the book of Deuteronomy, if you go. We notice what the Bible says, again, on the, on the subject of circumcision. Powerful words. Um, all right, so Deuteronomy 10 and verse 16. Notice how even in the Old Testament, we think this is a New Testament message, but this Paul is really simply reiterating what was made very crystal to the people of God in the Old Testament itself. Look at Deuteronomy 10 and verse 16. Here's what the Bible says. It says, circumcise therefore, Deuteronomy 10, 16, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Listen to that. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart. So we recognize in the circumcision of the physical flesh, that was a revelation. It was a sign that represented how God wanted to do away, just as a foreskin is cut and put away. Now, I, I'm helping us appreciate this, and you may, you may think of this analogy as very gross, but, but it's important to appreciate this. Can you imagine someone having his foreskin cut, then carrying, cherishing, just embracing his foreskin, keeping it close to him for the rest of his life. Can you imagine that? Carrying dead skin around for the rest of your life. I mean, it, it's cut, it's, it's, it's dead, it's supposed to be put away. And that's exactly what God was teaching, that the circumcision is an element that teaches you how the heart needs to be done away of all fleshly experiences, just as the physical flesh is cut and put away from the rest of the body. Our all fleshly dependence should be cut away and put away. Now, if you understand, friends, circumcision is a painful process. Are you recognizing this? This was a time when there were no anesthetic mediums given to people. It was outright chopping away of the flesh. It was a painful experience. And oftentimes, friends, when the roots of sin and flesh have gone deep into our lives, it takes a painful process of doing away the flesh from our lives. It is a terrible ordeal, but we definitely need it. We need a doing away of the flesh from our lives every day of our lives. And it is imperative that we strive to receive this from the Lord. And Paul is saying a physical cutting of the flesh is no true circumcision. 
True circumcision is that which is inward, which is in the heart. Now, let's notice how Paul turns from the flesh to the spirit. He says real circumcision happens within, happens in the heart. And true circumcision, it exalts what God has done, not what man does. In fact, in fact, come back to the, come back to the Old Testament and notice, notice what the Lord says. Is beautiful, beautiful words. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 6. Deuteronomy 30. We just read earlier in Deuteronomy 10, 16. Now read with me Deuteronomy 30 and verse 6. Notice what the Bible says. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. This is powerful. It says, the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and that thou mayest live. This is so powerful. So powerful. Notice what it is saying. It's saying first in Deuteronomy 10, we read, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. But now we're being told who is performing that act of circumcision. It's not our power. It is not in our strength to do away the flesh. It is God who will circumcise your heart. It is God who will put away the flesh from your heart and from the flesh from the heart of your seed so that in order for you to be able to love your God with all your heart, your soul, that you may live. Friends, the Bible says we need this circumcision in order to do what God says. We need this so that we may be able to love God the way we ought to. We cannot experience a genuine love for God until flesh has been chopped away and done away with. We cannot love God while still holding on to our flesh. And this is powerful, friends. This is powerful because Paul is saying true circumcision is happening within. It's happening in the heart. And it's exalting what God is. And God has done the circumcision. God is cutting off the fleshly nature by converting us deep within. The new birth of an individual, the one who has accepted Christ and is a new creation, that new creation is a true circumcision experience. It's powerful. Look at, look at Colossians 2. Paul, Paul takes this even deeper in and explains it much more clearer. In Colossians 2 and verse 11, notice what the Bible says. Colossians 2 and verse 11, the words of the Lord. Colossians 2 verse 11, the Bible says, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Friends, that is crystal. Let's read that again in Colossians 2.11. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That's the purpose. Purpose of circumcision, that physical act was typifying God's work of putting away the body, of, from just putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, not something I'm able to do in myself, something Christ is able to do deep within. Here in that text, you recognize that spiritual inward working of Christ on the heart is known as circumcision. In fact, it's known as circumcision of Christ. It is not done with hands. It's not, it's not your physical act. It indicates that there's no human effort that could make this a possibility. It is not cutting away of the physical flesh, but a cutting away, a doing away, a separation of the fleshly nature of sin through the indwelling and the inworking of Christ in our hearts. And it's possible, it's 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 powerful to recognize that. All of us are able to experience this. Why? Galatians 3.29, notice what the Bible says. Why is it that all of us can also experience this? Galatians 3.29 tells us. Galatians 3, verse 29, listen to what the Bible says. Galatians 3.29 says, And if ye be Christ's, that then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. There it is. All who receive Christ become heirs of all the promises made to Abraham. Those who are experiencing the true heart circumcision, 
they are the ones who are the real Jews. They are the ones who are the real Israel. What is Israel? The name itself. Israel means he who overcomes with God. And that's the whole point. That's a true Israelite who's circumcised within. Flesh is done away. God has made him an overcomer with God. And that's what Israel is. Israel is not a nationality. Israel is a character. It's the character of God. God who makes you an overcomer with him. That's the goal. And that's the work God wants to do in all our lives, friends. Now, none of us can boast of, of belonging to the right physical family. Oh, I'm part of the Jewish race. There's nothing to boast in that. Because what does Paul say? There is neither Jew nor Gentile, nor male nor female, nor bond nor free. Acceptance in God is based upon our own personal acceptance of Jesus in our lives as the one who does away the flesh so that we can live in the spirit. Now, no one can claim a special favor from God because their physical act of putting away the flesh, they're putting away the foreskin of their flesh. Because what God wanted to teach, what this physical experience thought was that there are things that are done. There are things that are done that we do in the flesh. And God wants to do away our dependence on the flesh, just like Israel that said, we will do. We are able to do it. We're not. God wants to do away that selfish dependence. You see, there were people who were seeking justification and salvation through the works of their own flesh. But God's new plan, God's new covenant says it is through Christ, not of your works, not of your fruits of your flesh, but it is what God is going to do in you. Because we're saved by grace through faith. It is the work of God, not of man, lest any should boast. There's nothing that we can boast in. So someone says, hey, so if Christ is doing it, that means our works are no longer important. You see, since the law cannot justify it, then we might as well abolish it, right? I think we've settled that argument a long time ago. You see, friends, the doctrine of the covenants establishes beyond any doubt that the law is just as important under the new as important as it is under the old. We spoke about this. Jesus does not change the law. He just changes the placement. Write it on tables of stone. In the new covenant, he says, I will write this law on the stones, on the, on the tablets of your heart. That's what I want to do. The law stays the same. The placement changes. That's, that's the work that God wants to do in our lives. Instead of graving it on stone, he wants to write it on our hearts. Instead of it being fulfilled in our strength, it is now fulfilled by Jesus living in us. We will unpack this thought in our future studies. Now, instead of keeping the law in order to be saved, we keep it out of the joy of our hearts because Jesus has saved us. Not doing it to be saved, but doing it because we are saved in Christ Jesus. The same is this, the works of obedience are there. But now they are for a different reason and from a different motive. We're not doing to try to get his favor. We're doing because he's already shown us favor. This is important. And for sometimes without realizing it, we don't recognize, but we begin to trust our traditional exercises, our religious practices. We try to lean on these things and try to claim we are spiritual because of a set of exercises that we engage in. Truth is, friends, there is no merit system that should clog the free channels of faith, love, and grace. There's nothing I can do that can make God love me more. There's, there's nothing I can do that will, that will get me extra love from God. God is love. He cannot deny himself, the Bible says. I cannot reduce his love for me. I can't do that. Obedience in its proper position is important. It is necessary, but it must always be in that position. It would be in the place that follows grace accompanied by love. If I'm trying to win God's favor by obedience, I'm going to fall short. It is his love that enables that obedience. It is Obedience is a response of the uh, unconditional, unbelievable love that God showers upon us. Truth is, listen carefully, friends, listen carefully. Truth is, we put ourselves back under the old covenant 
every time we begin to trust our own works to save us. Did you hear what I said? Every time you lean on your own ability, on your own talent, upon your own doing, to be thinking that that's what recommends me to God, I am putting myself under the old covenant all over again, all over again. That's the reality. Claiming to be under the new covenant, but when I lean on my own works of the flesh, I am literally putting myself under the old covenant all over again. Just as Israel of old, just as they could have received true circumcision by accepting the spiritual in workings of God, we too can fall back under the old covenant by trusting the flesh to save us. Just as they could come out of that old covenant and say, God, no, sorry, we made the wrong promise. We want you to help us. They could have come out of it at any time. In a similar way, we could go back anytime, even though we have been given Jesus' promises, we can always go back anytime, every time we say, no, I can do it on my own. I can, I put myself back again in that experience. And we've got to learn to hold on to Jesus. You've got to learn that only your holy God can help me keep a holy law. The God is holy, his law is holy, and I am unholy. How can an unholy being ever expect to keep a holy law? For an unholy being to keep a holy law, he needs a holy God that can enable him to keep a holy law. That is how that obedience is made possible. We need God all the way through. We need God to be able to see us through all of that. All of that. And it is just marvelously beautiful. The wonderful, wonderful truths that God seeks to teach us. God seeks to impress our hearts with. And he is just longing, friends. He is just longing that we do what his heart has longed for us to experience. He just longs for us to receive him more fully and to be able to experience the new life force that, that, that God wants to breathe into our lives. Now, I'd also like you to go with me as we take a look at a few of these quotes. I want you to talk about how this very God's law is real. God wants it in effect in our lives. And let's talk about the power of this law for a bit, because this is so, so important and something that needs to be paid attention to. So let me see if I can set up the screen for you and we will try and participate in that. So let's take a look. Okay. Hopefully this works out. Okay, let's see. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. Take a look at this quote. Very, very powerful. Notice what it says. Okay, uh, book early writings. Notice what the prophet says. She says, Satan is pressing in on every side. And unless we watch for him and have our eyes open to his devices and snares, unless we have on the whole armor of God, the fiery darts of the wicked will hit us. That's what he wants to do. Let's keep reading. She then says, there are many precious truths contained in the word of God, but it is present. I, I put that in captions, but she says, it is in, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. So the whole Bible is filled with truth, but what people, God's people need right now is present truth that is for our time, truth that is urgent for our time. Such subject, she says, as the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days, 
the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What about these subjects? They are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement. They show what our present position is. They establish the faith of the doubting and they give certainty to the glorious future. Oh, wait a minute. Speaking of present truth, the church, that's what God's people need right now. And then she points out these three subjects, the sanctuary, the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus. Now, here's what's powerful. She speaks of these subjects in the light of present truth. And she says these subjects, they're calculated to explain where we're coming from, the past Advent movement. They show us what our present position is. And they establish the faith of the doubting and give certainty to the glorious future. So wait a minute. These truths, rightly studied, reveal to us where we're coming from the past, show us what we should be doing in the present, and they give us hope for the future. Look at the holistic nature of these messages. And, you know, I just want to praise God, friends. We as Rekindle family, we've covered the sanctuary. We could always study more. But we've studied the sanctuary together. We've studied the faith of Jesus together. And now we're studying the commandments of God. And praise God for that. Praise God for that. These are present truths that need to go and reach the world. We need these truths in our lives. Understanding these truths, studying these truths so that we can tell the world about them. Why are they so important? Listen to this. She says, I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth. They dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and to sanctify the soul. Messengers are running away from these important points of present truth. And while a word is being presented from the Bible, the goal of the word is to unite God's people and sanctify the soul, this twofold purpose, the unity of the brethren and the sanctification of our lives. The present truth material does this. Present truth will create an urgency that will bring our hearts together. We have no time to fight. Brings our hearts together and calls for a sincere repentance and a wholehearted surrender to God. Satan, notice this, where present truth is not presented, messengers are running away. There Satan will here take every possible advantage to injure the cause. That's what the devil wants to do. When we're not focusing our attention on present truth, not uplifting present truth before the people, the devil is taking full advantage. These subjects, she's saying, I have frequently seen were the principal subjects on which the messengers should dwell. These prime subjects, the sanctuary, the Ten Commandments, the faith of Jesus, these are messages that God's messengers should be spending a lot of time on. So friends, we begin to ask that question. Are we taking the time? Are we taking the time to really study these very precious truths for our time? Are we taking the time to, to pick up these truths and to present them before the world? Because they are very, very important truths. They're truths for our time, truths that the Lord wants to bring to the world. But what are we doing as God's people? What are we doing as God's people? How much are we striving to bring these truths to the world? Now, God is teaching us through the commandments the desire and the passion of God to save his people. Now, come with me as we go to Matthew chapter 22. We, we had our scripture reading earlier. And listen to, listen to what the Bible says. Matthew 22. As you turn there, just going to set up the backdrop for you. The context of the story is that a, a disciple comes up to Jesus and, and one of the people, they come up and they have a question. This is a lawyer, by the way, that comes to Jesus, not a disciple. But he asks a question to Jesus and listen to his question. Matthew 22, verse 36. The lawyer says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? You know, Master, there are 10 commandments. Which, which one is the greatest? Jesus' response, verse 37. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Okay. Verse 39. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments 
hang all the law and the prophets. Listen to that. So Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? He says, well, the first one is that love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. The second, notice his words. He says the second great commandment is like the first one. And you ask the question, what is the likeness? What is the similarity between the first and the second great commandment? He says the second commandment, second great commandment is like the first one. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, wait a minute. The first one says, love God with everything you've got. The second is saying, love your neighbor. But wait, what's the similarity? What is the common denominator between the two great commandments? It is love. Very important, friends. The common binding agent between the two great commandments is love. Love God, love your neighbor. But then when you read in the Bible, for instance, 1 John 4, 8, listen to what the Bible says. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Listen to that truth claim, truthful statement. 1 John 4, 8 says, He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Now, wait a minute. Jesus is asked, what is the great commandment? He sums up the 10 by saying, love God, love man. In other words, the 10 can be summed up in one word. The word is love. In other words, Jesus is saying, all that the commandments speak of is love. So if the commandments are speaking of love, but 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. Wait a minute. If the commandments are talking and based on love, but 1 John 4 is saying God is love, what does that mean? What that means is that the commandments are talking about God. If the commandments are all about love, but God is love, that means the commandments are all about God. So if you want to know God better, you want to study his commandments better. If you want to understand and appreciate God's character better, You've got to study the transcript of his character, which is the Ten Commandments of God. That's the appeal. The appeal is to pay attention to God's word. The appeal is to receive the fullness of God's word. The appeal is to study the commands so that you receive a clearer understanding of the wondrous nature of God, the desire of God to save mankind. And that's what we're recognizing. The commandments are given because they define God. They, they help us understand and appreciate his character. Jesus sums it up in that fashion. And he says, that's what we need. But many people say, you know what? There it is. It's simple. God, God has done away the Ten Commandments. All I need to do is to love God. And that's strange because they say, oh, I love God and that's all that matters. But is it possible to love God and not do what God is asking us to do? Is it possible to say, oh, I love God, but I don't have to do what God is asking me to do? Doesn't Jesus himself say in John 14, 15, and we're talking about this in our next study, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Those are the words of the Lord. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So God is love. and the commandments are all about God because the commandments are all about love. And the Lord would have us appreciate that. And friends, the challenge is all of us want to love God on our own way. And that's not possible. Because you see, if God is love, God is the definition of love. I can't decide on my own how to love when God himself is love and teaches me what love is really about. Does that make sense? If God is love, I cannot be standing outside of God and claiming to love God. Because what am I doing? I'm back in the old covenant. I am in my own flesh wanting to do what I think is the right thing to do. This, this is very, very important. What we're thinking is that as long as I do what I think is right to do, I'm doing fine. But if you recognize what the Bible is saying, we recognize any attempt, any attempt to do things on our own, any attempt to fulfill and to try and do and to claim, well, we will do it. We're going back to the old covenant. We already spoke about that. 
So we need God to teach us what love is. And, and that's why when God says, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, he's not giving you a new commandment. He's speaking and explaining love for God is not you trying to love God on your own. You've got to follow God's way, God's method of love. You see, a husband and wife, imagine a home where the husband walks home and says, honey, I love you. I love you so much that I will never, ever speak to you ever again. And the wife says, honey, that's how, that's so loving of you. And, you know, I want to reciprocate that love. And I also love you so much that I will never, ever cook for you. How loving would that home be, friends? How loving is that home? Husband does not speak to the wife. Wife never wants to help out the husband with anything, never cook, never assist him with anything. But both claim to love each other. How is that possible? That's because both of them are trying to love each other on their own. There's no standard of measurement. You see, friends, I can't say I love God and try and do it all on my own, all on my own way. That's, again, going back to the old covenant. We will do it however we want. But see, when God says, Love God. That's the first and great commandment. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He's not giving you a new commandment. He's summing up the first four commandments that teach us how to love God. If you love God, you will have no other gods before him. If you love God, you will not bow down to any graven image. If you love God, you will not take his name in vain. If you love God, you will remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. The next six commandments teach you how to love man. Because if you love man, you will not, you will honor your father and mother. If you love man, you will not steal. You will not commit adultery. If you love your neighbor, you will not lie to your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you will not covet that which is your neighbor. If you love, that's what you will do. That's how love is revealed. I can't love any how I want. There is a standard of measurement. The standard is God, not me, not man. God is the standard of measure. He sets the, the, the stage for us. He sets the, the platform for us to be able to recognize and to receive what God wants for his people. And we need that, friends. We need the Lord to teach us. We need the Lord to instruct us. God is love. And he wants us to be a loving generation. In our next study, friends, it's going to be entitled Fulfilling the Law. The law is real. It's effective. It is in place. It's not done away. It's not vanished away. The word has made it crystal clear to us. It's made it clear again today that I can't love any how I want. God has set the standard and I just simply need to obey God. So if all of this is true, the next question I ask myself then is how do I do it? God is love. I get it. I can't do it on my own. God is able to do it. How do I then fulfill God's will? That's going to be our next study before we start getting into the 10 commandments, looking at each commandment and trying baking apart every commandment. We'll get to that. But in our next study, we're going to look at this very important key because friends, let me tell you, as we look at the 10 commandments, the bar is going to be raised so high. It's going to be discouraging. I'm telling you. If we don't look at this next command, next study, fulfilling the law, the bar is going to be raised. So I will be like, brother, there's no way I can live like that. That's too holy. But the Bible tells us with God, all things are possible. And he will teach his friends how the law can be fulfilled. But we have got to study. We've got to study that precious truth the Lord is revealing to us. So I invite you. I invite you and encourage you to join us next week as we go deeper and study how God can fulfill the law in our lives. If that is your desire, join me in prayer, please, as we pray. Let's pray. The Heavenly Father, thank you again. Father, your word is so real and so powerful. And we just thank you, God, for just being willing to teach us. We are not a worthy people, Lord. There's nothing we have done that qualifies us to receive the power of your word. This is your benevolence, your kindness, your faithfulness, your steadfastness that never changes. That bids us to come and receive the fullness of your love. And we just praise you and praise you for these gifts. I pray in a special way, God, that you would teach us, inspire us. That you would fill us with your spirit. That you would instruct us in divine righteousness. That 
You will help us to be who you want us to be, that we may always be found magnifying our Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I thank you for Rekindled Family. I thank you for your word. And I thank you, God, for you want us to always be walking close to thee. Thank you, Father, to help us understand an unholy people cannot keep a holy law without a holy God. So help us to seek you, Lord, and thank you for your desire to teach us how the law can be fulfilled. Glory be to your name. We are claiming your victory in our lives by faith in Jesus' name. Amen.